Welcome back Guardians. With the release of the new dungeon, Warlord's Ruin, I thought it would be a good time to cover our favourite Warlord, Shax. Shax had his own castle upon a mountain, was feared amongst other Warlords and Lightbearers alike, and even intimidated the Iron Lords during the Dark Age. While Shax is now truly committed to serving humanity, his past, like many Guardians, is littered with demons. But before starting, this video is sponsored by Raycon. While most of my 2024 goals are YouTube streaming related, I really do need to get back into the gym, which is in my garage. I just need to relocate the camping gear and get back to lifting. And Raycon is awesome for exercising. The perfect in-ear fit not only makes it comfortable, but they won't budge when working out. Trust me, my wife steals my Raycons to go running and they never fall out. The touch feature also makes it a great workout companion. Just double tap the Raycon symbol to pause or play media, single tap on the right for volume up or the left for volume down, which makes it easy to adjust your earbuds while working out. Apart from exercising, my family started talking about making another trip to Exmouth, where the whale sharks are, which is about a 13 hour drive. Thankfully, Raycon has 8 hours of playtime, which gets us most of the way there, but the charging case also holds up to 32 hours of battery, so you just need to pop them in for the last bit of juice. I can also switch between noise isolation mode or awareness mode, and noise isolation mode is great when I'm sharing the earbuds as it blocks out the rumble from the car. So if you want to see why Raycon earbuds have tens of thousands of five-star reviews, click the link in the description or go to buyraycon.com slash mylan to get 15% off your Raycon purchase plus free shipping. The earliest records we have of Shax's actions are from the late Dark Age, from the web lore released titled Remembrance. In this web lore, we get to see the kind of reputation that Shax had in those days, as the Iron Lord fell into challenges Shax to a duel for control over his territory. In those days, Warlords fought other Warlords, and Iron Lords also fought with Warlords for territory, often with regular people caught in the crossfire. Shax established his territory as a safe haven, protecting non-Guardians from the ravages of war, and had held the mountaintop for more than a century already. So we'll be going through pieces of the Remembrance lore entry in sections, since it's quite long. And in the first section, we see Saladin and Ephrodite talking to Felwinter, an Iron Lord who has challenged Lord Shax to a duel. Felwinter believes that Shax has a better chance of defending his people if he were to team up with the Iron Lords. Felwinter offers the 1v1 duel for territory because there is less likelihood of injuring civilians, as the other option for the Iron Lords is to take the castle by force, which would likely hurt civilians and potentially result in Iron Lord casualties. We would later learn that there was also a Seraph bunker underneath Shax's castle, and Felwinter at that time was in pursuit of Siva, so avoiding an assault was ideal. You would not be wrong in getting the impression that Shax is the good guy here. Even though technically a warlord, the way the lore is written paints the Iron Lords as having an overall good intention, however they are willing to accept civilian casualties to achieve their goals. Whereas Shax is like, I'm so strong, I can defend my own people, everyone leave me alone. That being said, Shax did enforce his law with lethality to maintain peace, which we'll talk about a bit later. Right, so have a listen to the Iron Lords discussing their plan to 1v1 Lord Shax and consolidate his territory. Warlord Shax accepts my challenge, Felwinter said, summarizing its contents. He advises us to enter from the south wall, which has been destroyed, the front door. He picked up the paper and scrutinized it again. It's undergoing weatherproof. This is your plan, Ephrodite said, with some skepticism. How did he get this to you? His ghost brought it. Your plan is ill-advised, Saladin said, and a waste of time. No one's beat Shax in a fight, Iron Lords or Warlords, Ephrodite continued, much less take territory from him. Ikora has, and I believe I can, Felter replied, his eyes burning inside his sleek exoskull. Ephrodite tapped the table with her fingers, and Saladin stared into the polished surface. Unless either of you has a better idea, we're running out of time. Saladin shook his head. It's true, Radagast wants to launch a frontal assault, entire Lord fire teams. Ephrodite's eyes narrowed under her helm. He wouldn't. There's almost a hundred people in that castle. Shax is holding those people hostage. They stay with him willingly, Felonta replied. The Warlords might pull the trigger, but Radagast wouldn't, Ephrodite repeated. Have you seen Radagast lately? 
he's tired of the wars. No one's been at it longer. That's no excuse. We came under him to end the infighting. Fairwinter stood. Then let me do my part for the cause. So this is what I'm talking about. Radagast, the leader of the Iron Lords, is threatening to invade the castle if Shax doesn't surrender or they can't find a solution. And the Iron Lords know this would be disastrous for the people living under Shax's protection. Then, in the story, there's a bit of a time jump where Felwinter is now meeting with Shax and speaking to him before their 1v1. Perhaps I'm not being clear, I'm not going anywhere, and you lot aren't coming in. As long as I hold this territory, there will be no collateral damage from turf wars inside our borders. Iron Lords and Warlords be damned. Your south wall says otherwise. And you're starting to piss me off. Are you here to duel or whine? Fenwinter guessed that Shax now stood a little more than three feet from him. The Iron Lord stepped forward, dragged a solar sword from the air and thrust it at Shax. The Warlord turned his stance sideways as the burning blade sung past his helm, ducked the horizontal cut that followed and stepped back as Fenwinter drove the blade into the stone floor. The chamber erupted with ethereal fire and solar light. Shax's back fist took Fenwinter's head from his shoulders in a shower of sparks. The Iron Lord's light died with his crumbling form. Ephrodite coughed as Saladin blinked inside his helm. Felwinter's ghost unfolded above his prone corpse and the Iron Lord re-emerged from a pillar of cascading light. You should have used your void instead, Shaq said. You could have brought the whole fort down on us, gained a fighting chance. The Iron Lord shook his head. Your people wouldn't have survived that. Shaq's hands engulfed Felwinter's shoulders like descending moons. I would have stopped you, but I like your thinking. Now get out. As you can see, Shax is very capable of defending his territory from light bearers, whether that be warlords or iron lords, and at this stage won't trust the protection of his people to anyone else. Despite this, the iron lords still believe that Shax's castle will eventually fall to neighboring warlords, and so want him to join them for the safety of his people. Felwinter wants to continue with the 1v1 duels with Shax in order to change his mind. While Ephrodite warns that Shax might get annoyed and go after Felwinter's ghost if he continues to try. Have a listen to the entry. Ephrodite had a hand on a helmeted chin. We can buy time. Warlords in this region respect a prolonged challenge against Shax. Her eyes flickered to Felwinter beneath the helmet. Shax has multiple confirmed kills, final deaths. It's no small thing to challenge him. Most of those cowards won't and they'll gladly let you try again till Shax decides to go after your ghost. So after losing his 1v1, Felwinter is given a deadline to defeat Shax or convince him to join the Iron Lords. The larger collection of the Iron Lords are currently elsewhere, busy dealing with the Fallen Uprising, and so Felwinter has until they have finished to successfully persuade Shax to join them, otherwise they would gather the full force of the Iron Lords to take Shax's territory by force. The forces needed to take Shax's territory by force is a testament to his power. The only guardian to have ever beaten him in a fight is a Ray, which is revealed in the Witch Queen Clater's edition. This places Shax as one of the most powerful guardians of all time. But what is less spoken about is how Cage 6 also bested Shax in the Crucible. The Lucky Pants lore tab implies that Cade beat Shax in a Crucible match However, Cade was considered to be cheating, so it was not documented properly. Cade argues, no, I didn't illegally mod the holster, they're just really lucky pants. Whether cheating or not, we assume that Cade did in fact beat Shax at some point because the Forsaken class item, Wing Discipline, Wing Contender and Wing Therium, describes a dodgeball match that Cade forces Shax to participate in because he lost against Cade with Cade saying, don't ever try to outrace my golden guns. Anyway, let's jump back to the Dark Age. Shax defeating Felwinter with such ease was no mean feat either. Felwinter is the light bearer born from Rasputin's code in a dead exo frame, and as we find out from the same Remembrance web lore, also an Iron Lord of great power, having fought and won and even destroyed the ghosts of other light bearers and other warlords over the course of his life like Saiten. Over the next few weeks, Shax would repeatedly defeat Felwinter in 1v1 duels, never losing. However, Felwinter would slowly change Shax's mind, as in between the duels, Felwinter assisted Shax to protect his people from a storm. 
fell into offer to use a well of radiance to keep the people warm during this storm. Thelwinter was able to show that he truly cared about the people Shax was protecting, and that if Shax continued to remain independent, his people would be hurt by the impending Iron Lord assault or by the surrounding warlords. Thelwinter's persistence eventually paid off, and Shax would eventually agree to align himself with the Iron Lords, but refuses to take on the Iron Lord title. Have a listen. Saladin and Shax stood in silence as the other lords began their march up the path. Hello said Saladin. Hello, Shax said. They shook hands. Iron Lord Shax? No. Now, I have painted a pretty noble perspective of Shax as a warlord, but he does have blood on his hands as a warlord, which I'll talk about at the end of this video, as it's a conversation he has with Mithrax much later in the lore. After this alliance was struck, Shax would move with his people to Vostok Observatory in the Cosmodrome. In the Iron Banner card from the House of Wolves expansion in Destiny 1, it's mentioned that Saladin was once Shax's mentor. Given the context given by the Remembrance web lore, I find it hard to believe that that mentorship was in the form of combat. Saladin seemed to have no confidence in the ability of any Iron Lord to defeat Shax in combat, and honestly I can't blame him. Rather, I speculate that this mentorship might have been in battle strategy or logistics. Later, during the early city age, Shax moved his people to the last city, became a prominent member in the city's history. Along with Saint 14, Osiris and Saladin, Shax would take part in the Battle of Six Fronts. While we don't know too much about his exploits during this battle, we do know from the entry War Stories from the lore book The Pigeon and the Phoenix that Shax lost one of his horns during this fight. Shax was also notably involved with the Ahamkara hunts. The Ahamkara were wish dragons that the vanguard deemed too dangerous to exist. They dispatched guardians on Ahamkara hunts and wiped out the entire species except for one rivet. And now we know there are even more Ahamkara eggs that remained hidden. Shax is documented as having taken part in these hunts. In the lore tab for the grips of the great hunt, Shax shows his respect to the great beast he has just defeated. Take a listen. Eris and Zavala watched as Shax sat with the dying Ahamkara, a hand on its snout. Is he gloating? She asked. I think he's too pragmatic to gloat, Zavala said. Mourning then? Perhaps. The Ahamkara twitched. Its eyes rolled up in its head. The biochemical glow just beneath its skin grew harsh. Zavala and Eris raised their hands against the increasing glare. Then the corpse exploded. Dirt showered the guardians like dusty rain on a clear day. Shaq sat silently in the resulting crater, covered in sheet of green fire. Zavala and Eris opened their mouths to speak, but Shax interrupted them. Shh, he said, as the flame quietly roared. They could all hear a disembodied whisper, but they were used to that by now. I think it says a lot about Shax's character that he understands the moral complexity of the decision the Vanguard had to make. The armed Kara were not outrightly hostile to humanity, but their wishes posed many dangers. Shax understands why they need to die, but still takes the time to comfort the dragon in its last moments and mourn its passing with respect. This is likely not the only Ahamkara that Shax hunted, since we can see an Ahamkara skull hanging above his usual spot in the tower. Shax's most iconic and heroic moments would come during the next major conflict between the Fallen Houses and the city, perhaps the closest the city ever came to falling before the Red War. This was the Battle of Twilight Gap, where the Fallen Houses united and besieged the city. There is a moment in this battle where Saladin gives the order to retreat. Shax, along with his fire team, which included the famous hunter Anna Bray, would defy this order and heroically hold the wall. Let's take a look at Shax's response to the command to retreat from the lore tab of the mountaintop, including its flavor text. In the heat of battle, Guardian, you will know the right choice to make, Lord Shax. Fire team leaders, do not advance on the wall, fall back to the ridge back district. Shax freezes with the Vandal's windpipe in his fist. He waits for Saladin to justify the strategy. I repeat, all teams rally at the ridge back district, do not advance, the city is lost. Shax drops the Vandal, then empties the rest of his clip into a captain. He and his fire team are running on fumes. The dead, fallen, and guardian alike litter the twilight gap. Shax, do you copy? He risks a look over his shoulder at their home, the place they call the last safe city. Not burning, not yet. Gritting his teeth, he reloads. Shax, your orders are to retreat. He sees a gap in the onslaught of invaders and gestures to the others. Mkechi, take Abdi and Truce, Lu Feng with me, Bray, cover us. This battlefield is not your stage, Shax. This is not about glory. His fire team doesn't hesitate. 
Shax for the final time fall back. As the six of them crest the wall, Shax cuts the feed. Shax's decision to not retreat single-handedly saved the last city, but of course greatly damaged his relationship with Saladin and to some extent Zavala. After seeing how close the last city came to falling during Twilight Gap, Shax decided to mentor Guardians in the Crucible until he was confident in the new generation of warriors. However, he would still involve himself in a few notable events that occurred after this time. It is unclear if Shax was physically present at the Battle of Burning Lake, but he was clearly involved from his actions afterwards. Following a narrow victory at Burning Lake, the consensus, comprised of the Vanguard and faction leaders and led by the Speaker, were discussing the possibility of invading Crota's hive base on the moon. In the lore tab of the Ray's Lighter Exotic Sword from Destiny 1, we see Shax crashing this meeting to express his opinions and concerns. Take a listen. Bang. What madness is this? Lord Shax, the consensus did not. We barely eked out victory at Burning Lake, and now you think we're ready to attack the moon? We're preparing. Did you not read my report from Burning Lake about the Hive's weapons? Those swords? They're like nothing we've ever... Lord Shax, Zavala, you can't think this wise. We need to examine these swords, train against them. This is a matter for the consensus to decide, old friend. Shax wants to study the Hive more, as he realizes that they are not like any other enemy the last city has faced. He cautions restraint and tries to get the consensus to reconsider, but his warnings go unheeded, and the consensus approves the plan to invade the Hive base on the moon. The last city would pay dearly for this mistake, as that fight would come to be known by humanity as the Great Disaster. Here's Eris Morn's memories of this event in her correspondence with Mara Solv from the Letters from Eris Law Book. It reads, Uncontrollable rage fills me as the nightmare of Crota returns to taunt me for my failures once again. I'm always failing. The countless lives taken during the great disaster, my fire team and my own lost humanity, they all have come rushing back. I'm trying in vain to stop a waterfall with a tree branch. I'm overwhelmed. I fail again. The Eater of Hope laid waste to world after world in his pursuit of the Traveler. My friends, his sword stole their light. Their light. There was never a path to forgiveness with Crota. He had to be eradicated. We have to wonder if the outcome would have been any different if only the Vanguard had heeded Shax's warnings. Since then, Shax has focused his efforts on supervising the Crucible and commanding his Red Jacks to secure new arenas for his matches. As you know, we have got heaps of new PvP maps in Destiny, so the Red Jacks have been pretty busy. As a supplementary note, his force of Red Jacks are more impressive than they first might appear with their ability to share memories via a data sharing system. As revealed in the Ghost Fragment, Sector 618, they also seem to be able to modify themselves as we find out when a ghost scans a Red Jack frame in the tower. Jax commands a rather formidable robot force. Moving along to more recent conflicts that involve Shax, the Red War. Shax assisted with protecting and evacuating civilians there is also a lore entry from the lore book Ava's Journey that reveals that Shaq skillfully helped her evacuate the tower during the Red Legion attack. Listen to an excerpt from her account of their escape. Another explosion and a fire door slammed shut. Tess was gone and Ava found herself with about 30 people in a small cargo bay between Tower North and the Hall of Guardians. A man was trying the far door, shouting that it was sealed. Then the roof came down as a large sphere crashed to the decks. Cabal clambered from the pod, struggling against their bulky armor as it began to fire at the civilians. That's when a dazzling blast of energy took them from behind. The shouting was enough for 10 men, but when Ava could see again, only one massive guardian was there, ending a Cabal soldier with a blade as long as she was tall. The helmeted face of Lord Shax turned this way and that, taking in the room. Two quick strides brought him to her side. With a surprising gentleness, he helped Ava to her feet. Madam, he intoned, and she could feel the base of his voice in her chest. I need your help. At his insistence, she took charge of the civilians as he took point for their little group. With the confidence and looming presence of the Crucible Master at her back, it was effortless to keep others quiet and focused. When they reached an evac site, a trio of anxious-looking Hawk pilots waited with their craft. As the last of the group climbed aboard, Shax laid a heavy hand on her shoulder. He towered over her as he said simply, Comrade. And then he was gone, back toward the fighting, his massive sword slung over his shoulder. Ava's last view of the tower as her hawk pulled away was ruin and flame. Shax's behavior here is nothing short of heroic, his talent for leadership is also on full display. 
So with that, we're all caught up on the major events from Shaxx's story, or at least the ones that are covered in the lore. However, there are a few additional stories that deserve some attention. For starters, the story where the helmet stayed on, with Shaxx and Mara Solve is very popular among players. In case you actually haven't heard the lore about where the helmet stayed on and where it came from, let me read it to you. Ironically, for this season, it involves the Wall of Wishes. Have a listen to the Mark of the Great Hunt. It reads... Mara stared at the Wall of Wishes. She had no more bargains to make. Her plans were in motion. There was nothing left but the weight. She pulled a sidearm from a hidden holster and cracked a dozen rounds into the wall. The cosmic balance shifted. Somewhere in the Dreaming City, Riven heard the Queen's wish, and a thousand shrieking tears in reality cut through the space in front of her. Lord Shax suddenly blocked Mara's view of the wall. Yes, and we'd all be dead. He was screaming at no one, with a mug of caffeine in his fist. He started, almost spilling his coffee. Where are we? Mara slapped the mug out of his hand. It shattered on the floor. She shoved a weathered book in his face. I told you there would come a time when I collect for the Reef Wars. Read this out loud. No one tells me what to do, he said, grabbing the book and incinerating it in a bolt of striker lightning. I can recite the Tempest by heart. And he did. Mara sat and listened. They stayed for a long time. The helmet stayed on. Pretty funny how Riven just denied our wish to follow the witness, but willingly summoned Shax to read the Tempest to Marasov. Anyway, the Witch Queen Collector's Edition would also confirm what was meant by the helmet stayed on. After finishing reciting the Tempest, Shax and Mara would talk about Shaw Ido. Shax had become good friends with Shaw before her mysterious death, and so he and Mara traded fond memories of Shaw. As they debated inaccuracies in each other's memories, Mara said, Mara was delighted by my disbelief. She told me that she would tell me the truth about Shaw if I would only take off my helmet, so she could look into the eyes that had gazed so often on her beloved. My interpretation of this is that Shax didn't need to hear Mara's truth and was happy with his own memories of Shaw Ida, his own memories of his own friend, and so his helmet stayed on. Now for something a bit more dark. Shaq survived the Dark Age, but not without a lot of regret and actions that serve the title of a warlord. This is best reflected in the lore tab of the survivor's epitaph, Hand Cannon, where he meets with and speaks with Mithrax, another old soldier who has made decisions that weigh on their conscience. Have a listen to this. To be the first elixir to bask in the presence of the traveler since the whirlwind was an honor that Mithrax, Kel of House Light, never imagined for himself. As he stood on the tower walkway below the scar left in the wake of the Almighty, he meditated on the choices in his life that had led to this point. He wondered if there was a unifying thread binding all those events together, but he would have no time to ponder such things. A shadow crept over Mithrax, broad shoulders, a curling horn. Seeing the stark outline of Lord Shax looming on the stairs elicited centuries-old instincts, and it was temperance that kept Mithrax's hands from his weapon. I didn't expect to actually find you here, Shax said as he continued down the stairs with slow, plodding steps. Were you there? What? Shax came to stand beside Mithrax at the railing. Were you there? He asked again. This time he pointed, without looking into a place on the horizon beyond the Traveller. Mithrax followed Shax's gesture with his eyes. He did not understand. The Battle of Six Fronts, Shax insisted, with uncharacteristic softness. Do you know how many fallen I killed there? Mithrax bristled at the question, and he felt the instinctual urge to reach for his weapons again. But the presence of the Traveler and the question that nagged at the back of his mind stayed his hand. How many, he asked, not wanting to know the answer. Shax deflated, folded his arms over the railing, and rested his considerable weight against it. Hundreds, he said quietly. All of them died afraid. Mithrax felt ether mixing with bile on the back of his throat. His limbs trembled, rage burned in his gut, demanding manifestation, but he tempered his anger, sighed so deep that the ether on his breath was briefly visible as an iridescent cloud. How many humans have you killed? Shax wondered. Too many, Mithrax answered, and even that felt insufficient on his tongue. The thought of it twisted his insides around. He sighed again, deeper this time, and Shax watched the sublimated ether glitter in the dim lights. When I heard you were in the tower, Shax said, I thought I'd just throw you over the edge of the wall. I thought about the people I watched die at the hands of your houses over the years, the lightless torn limb from limb during the Dark Age. He snorted out a rueful laugh. Then I started to think about them. Silence hung in the air for a moment, long enough for Mithrax to ask, Who? 
three scavengers huddled together in a collapsed storm drain. They had stolen food during a, a time of famine. Maybe it was for themselves, maybe another settlement, maybe family. Shaq shrugged. I killed them, all three, with my bare hands. My victims were humans too, Shaq clarified, and the Kel felt his anger twist into confusion. I was a warlord in the Dark Ages, convinced myself of the necessity of my own barbarism by painting it with noble colours. Those loyal to me built a legend that masked the blood and the rot, but it's still there. He tapped his finger against his breastplate, deep down. The shadows had become long, stars now visible in the sky, and the Traveller was cast in half shadow. There was a ship, Mithrax eventually replied. It may have been soldiers, civilians, I do not know. He looked away from the Traveller as he spoke. I led a boarding party onto it. We slaughtered anyone who resisted and rounded up those who surrendered. Shax turned to look at Mithrax, a wordless question in his faceless mask. We argued what to do with the prisoners. Some suggested we keep them as warning trophies. Others said to barter with them. Mithrax looked away, shoulders sagged. But I was young, impatient. He closed his eyes. I opened the airlock. It seemed the simplest solution. Both soldiers sank into silence again and remained so as the last glimpse of sunlight descended upon the horizon. Shaq suddenly took his leave and Mithrax was left with the remnants of anger and confusion and paradoxically an answer. He saw then the thread of choices leading to this moment, the choices that led to the great machine and away from a fate like Aramis had suffered. It was something both he and Shaxx learned to accept in spite of a lifetime of experience telling them otherwise. Mercy. Shaxx has blood on his hands and his disposition means that he's not the type of person to ever forget. He's done the wrong thing for the right reasons but doesn't let his regrets stop him from acting decisively when the need arises. He expresses himself openly and admittedly through yelling. Quite frankly, the role of Crucible Handler seems too little for a man of his talents and reputation, and hopefully we get to see him take center stage at some point in the future of Destiny 2. Now, for a couple of rapid-fire tidbits, because this script is already way too big and I can't be bothered anymore, Shax was responsible for forging the Destiny 1 swords from the fragments of Oryx's blade, Willbreaker. Shax was infected by Sabathun's viral chant. Who knows if this will lead to anything? Recently, Saladin seems to be trying to reconcile with Shaxx over their falling out over Twilight Gap, though it's unclear exactly how receptive Shaxx is to it. And finally, Shaxx seems unsettled by the events of Lightfall, specifically regarding the Witness's victory over the Traveller. And with that, that concludes this latest Destiny 2 Law episode. If you'd like to support the channel and cannot leave a comment, you can leave the word Lord Shaxx. As usual, it's been a pleasure. This is Marlon Games. Peace.